So before we actually begin taping, this whole talk is going to be ridiculous. And we're okay. Are the bars? Uh, nobody, nobody enjoys that. Okay, zinc. And uh, we'll turn it straight over. I'll turn that on. Okay. Okay, uh, welcome to Lockpicking Forensics. I'm DG, and that's all the intro you're going to get. Uh, normally, I don't care if you shout stuff out and ask questions, but we really don't have time, and I don't want to ruin the SQL guy's talk, because I actually would like to see it. So... Q&A afterwards, uh, if I'm not busy at the SQL talk. Uh, first, we're going to go over real quick how locks and picks work. Um, that's really the only introduction I'm going to give, so hopefully you're at the lock picking village. Uh, how, many, how many of you get used to that, because that'll be happening for the next hour. Uh, how many of you are familiar with how locks and lock picking on a basic level works? How many, how many of you went to the village? The rest of you were suckers, right? Just kidding. Uh, we're going to go through that. We're going to look at normal wear on the lock, because that's always a big question. <laughs> and the talk goes downhill from here after all the Guinness show up. Uh, we're going to look at normal wear and how normal use affects locks and keys. Uh, we're going to then uh, analyze locks for forensic evidence of quite a few different uh, attacks. We're going to look at keys for the same thing. Uh, at the end, if we have time, we'll go through the uh, general investigative processes as it relates to uh, forensic locksmithing, they call it investigative locksmithing. Uh, before we begin, <laughs> before we begin, you should know this talk isn't going to have uh, any destructive entry stuff, only because A, we don't have time, but B, I don't find it as, as interesting as all the covert stuff. It's really obvious when somebody has kicked in your door, um, <laughs> blown up your door. But even in these cases, we need to consider that maybe it was just used as a way to hide the actual method of entry. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind, and that is one of my best works right there. Uh, how many of you know how locks work? Like, can we skip this and save five minutes? How many of you don't know how locks work? Oh, man. How, how, how many of you don't know how lock picking works? Yeah. Real quick, crash course in lock picking. That's how the lock looks from the outside. This is called a pin tumbler lock. That's what we're going to use for our examples. It's the absolute most popular lock worldwide. Uh, and it's pretty much everywhere in this building, everywhere you work, everywhere you live. Inside it looks like this. It's uh, pairs of pins, top pin, bottom pin, and a spring on top to push them down. The way it works is that normally they all sit here. The blue pins all block that inner piece from rotating when you use the key. The key raises those to the right position so that they can split and that inner piece can rotate. Okay? Pay attention. <laughs> so these uh, amazing lock tunes are all thanks to Deviant. So just real quick. Um, so that's how it works. And in, in a real lock, there's a series of pins. It's not just this one stack. It's traditionally five, sometimes four, six, seven. Uh, and they're all raised to the right height, like in our last picture. Uh, so the way lock picking works is that we might think that pin chambers are drilled all together and that when we rotate that inner piece, we're hitting all of them at once. In the animation, you can see them jiggling just a little bit. What really happens is that either the pin chambers are off, the pins are off, the pins are oval, the chambers are oval. There's various manufacturing defects that cause, in the animation, just that third pin will hit first. For whatever reason, that'll, that'll happen. It's, it's not really important to us how it happens, just that it happens, and this is what makes lock picking work. I really hope this next animation doesn't crash it. I don't know why it does. Okay, that's, that's not an animation, but... <laughs> So the way we pick a lock is we're going to use a tool to apply tension. Normally when you use the key, you're rotating the key, and that's your, your tension point. We're going to find that one pin that's binding, in, as in the previous slide. We're going to raise that pin pair so that it can split at the right position like the key does, and then we're going to repeat that, that process for the rest of them. As we're doing this, the tension tool is holding all the pins that we split at the right height if we get them there, and once they're all at the right height, the, the lock opens. And this is the animation that I'm worried will break it. All right. Okay. So we insert our tool. That's a tension tool. The pick comes in. 
He's looking for the binding pin. And so those two were loose. But that one wasn't. And so that was the binding pin. Our tension tool holds that up. We go through, find the others, and that's the other binding pin. And now that one, and now that one, and the lock opens. And so that's, that's it's very simple. Locks in themselves are very simple, and that's how it works, and that's how uh, basic lock picking is done. So this idea of forensic locksmithing is um, a lot of times at the cons, and I'm more than guilty of this, is that people uh, kind of portray lock picking as this, un, you can't find out that your lock was picked. And from the outside, that's absolutely true in most cases, um, as well as for other techniques. But there's this idea of forensic locksmithing, and it started in 1976 with a gentleman named Art Pahoki. He was of the Chicago PD, and uh, he decided, you know what, I'm going to do a bunch of shit to locks, and I'm going to, you know, test various levels of wear on keys and the internals, and I'm going to figure out how I can tell which techniques were used and how to identify tools, suspects, uh, trace evidence. He's really the, the father of this, by all accounts. And so you can see, that was 1976. That's over 30 years ago. Yeah, 30 years ago. And uh, so it's been around for a long time, but you'll find there's almost no public resources on this um, until I made a site. Um, so the, really the best English resource is this book called Lock Safes and Security by Mark Tobias. I'm sure you've seen him at DEF CON, other conferences. It's absolutely the best book on locks and lock picking and that sort of thing. But it's very expensive. You can technically buy specific sets of chapters for cheap, but the book itself is about two, 250, 200 just for the basic version, and then 400 for a locksmith version, and 800 for a government version. But if you are interested in this, this is absolutely the best book you can buy. It's not worth, in my opinion, buying a you know $80 book on just general lock picking when you could just buy this and get, I think it's like 30,000 pages as well as audio and video. It's insane. It's so big, he can't even make it in print anymore, the full book. It's almost, I think almost all the new versions are in fact multimedia. Um, so that's the book. You can buy the forensic chapters, I think, for 60 bucks, which is good if you want to get into that. But really, I think if you're that interested in it, you might as well just buy the whole book. There's a German fellow, uh, and I don't know how to pronounce his last name, so I won't try, but that book, uh, translated means tool traces, and it's supposed to be excellent. It's supposed to be uh, one of the best, or, or actually probably the only book that specifically deals with forensic locksmithing. Um, but it's in German, so I can't read it, so I can't tell you if it truly is amazing. But it does have amazing pictures, um, because he uses much better equipment than I do. There's also this book, Impressioning, by uh, Oliver Diedrichsen. Uh, it's normally in German. You could buy a translated version. It's kind of, the, the translation's a little bad, but it's actually a very good book. And uh, the guy who wrote the Tool Traces book does a, a short, like, 10-page section on forensics of impressioning using the really awesome equipment that makes all my pictures look really, ba look really bad. So the, the role of the forensic locksmith in, in modern day is to determine a, a method of entry, how somebody could have uh, got into somewhere. They identify uh, specific evidence, tool marks, the techniques used. Uh, they could go on to provide uh, information about the skill level of attackers, the number of attackers, the, the time it might have taken to do the uh, entry, how expensive it would have been, if special tools would have been required. And all of that is given to police or insurance companies or you know whoever hires them to, to look at their locks. And it doesn't even necessarily need a crime. It could just be that uh, a, an agency wants to evaluate their security or just maybe they don't even know there's a crime, but they have to, for insurance reasons, look at the internals of the locks to determine if anything's been attempted or done against them. And the last thing that they do that's uh, pretty important is they provide expert testimony uh, in a lot of the criminal or insurance things. Is they'll, they'll eventually go on to to push, I don't want to say push because that sounds bad, but they'll, they'll explain their, their findings. And in a lot of cases, just them writing a report before they even need to testify will just end that lawsuit right away. Either they'll pay out or some, some party will just give up because it's really hard to argue with such you know, damning evidence like that. You can't be like, no, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. No, but it does happen. And so sometimes they do need to go through and do expert or even civilian testimony. Um, so that's what that is. Uh, before we look at how uh, all the techniques work, 
We'll look at how locks look new as well as through various states of wear. And I want you to know, Medico, nice companies, they all do this with a really cool machine that goes with a key to simulate wear. I did this all by hand because A, I don't have a machine, and B, it seems much more realistic. And it was. <laughs> uh, some of the complaints with the machines are that they're too perfect and they don't simulate when you're drunk and you miss or when you, you push it to the side too far. And it is important and it does have an effect on wear. But the statistics are kind of, no one really cares about if it's going to work a million times or 25 million times or that sort of thing. But here's what a pin looks like new. And this was in, in our previous animation. This is the bottom pin. It's rounded. You can see the milling marks. And it's very distinct. There's no scratches, no dents. It looks new, right? That's what a key looks like new. And this is... I should specify all these things are brass, and that's uh, the most common thing. There's different materials, but we don't have time. We'll just stick with brass. Key looks new, and that's a factory original key. Probably only been used five or six times, so pretty much new. Uh, you'll see there's no real big marks. It looks okay. It looks fairly smooth as far as keys go. The plug, that, that inner part of the lock that rotates, also looks pretty new. No scratches, just the milling marks, just the broaching marks. Pin after 100 uses um, of turning, putting the key in, turning it completely, and removing it, <laughs> you're going to enjoy this as we go on, is that uh, it's basically gently rubbing against the bottom of those pins as it raises it. That mark, I think I have a close-up. I do. Uh, that mark is actually the, the key slightly polishing and removing those milling marks. And you can see, there's my mouse, right here. It's starting to do that, and those milling marks are becoming less, less uh, profound. And in the previous one, farther away, you can see that's also lubricant that it's depositing, and brass is self-lubricating, so it's helping to do that, I think. Don't quote me. And, and edit that part. Uh, the plug, after 100 uses, the outside of the plug, is going to have these marks where those top pins were rubbing against it as it's rotating. It, it's not too much of a thing on wear, but I thought I'd include it because it, it's interesting. Key after 100 uses looks pretty pretty different. Uh, the black line is the lubricate lub, lubricate Jesus lubricant uh, in the middle of the key, and you can see it's only in the middle because that's the only place these pins are touching. You can also see very light uh, crevices starting to be made. After 1500 uses, that's right by hand, it gets better. <laughs> after 1500 uses, uh, this is the first pin in, and can anybody tell me? Uh, well. I'll, I'll wait for a Q&A of ridiculousness. Uh, so you can see all the milling marks are pretty much gone, almost all of them. There's a little light scratching that's caused by the key also getting worn down, becoming more jagged in certain areas. But most of our milling marks are gone. This is pin 5. Why does pin 5 look a lot different than pin 1? That's correct. He said less bumps going past it. And what he means is the, the pin 5 is only touched by the very tip of the pin. But pin 1 rides the entire length of the key as it's being inserted. So pin 5 is going to have a lot less wear. And you'll also notice there's a lot more scratches. And that's for the same reason as the tip of the key will have the most wear on the key. And it'll be the most jagged and the most uneven. And so it's also scratching it like that. At 1,500 uses, this is a real close-up of the key. You'll see that it looks a lot worse. The, the crevices are a lot bigger, a lot more lubricants deposited. And that's what's contributing to those scratches on that back pin. The plug also continues to wear, more staggering of the lubricant, more wear. At 5,000 uses, almost all of our milling marks are gone on pin 1. It looks you know, completely polished for the most part. Pin 5 continues to wear down, but it also develops this oval, sometimes uh, it looks like a figure 8 is shape, and that's because normally uh, pins 1 through 4, most of the front pins, as we insert the key, they're being rotated back and forth and spinning and spinning, and so the wear distributes evenly. But that back pin is only getting touched by the tip of the key, so it's not getting that full range of rotation that all the other ones normally get. So it develops this kind of uh, odd, that they were locking us in, <laughs> this uh, odd, weird oval shape. And you can also see that there's still quite a few milling marks. It's a lot different than almost all the other pins. 5,000 uses plug, again, continues to wear down. The plug after 5,000 uses, and this one's interesting. How many of you have ever missed your keyway? And you don't have to be drunk to do this. 
I'm sure every one of you has done it. You just, you're off by a little bit. A lot of scratches, a lot of dents, and at the top, you'll notice there's a mark, and that's, most pin tumbler keys are shoulder stopped, which means that that back part of the key where you hold it is what stops it from going in farther. So after a long time, that repeated putting it in and out, especially on drunk nights when you don't know how much force you're applying, it starts to weigh down a little, get a little broken down, just like the rest of the face. At 5,000 uses, our key continues to develop these pretty deep uh, crevices, and that's contributing to some light, light scratching on the, the internals of the lock. So we know all these things, and that's pretty standard. You know, you could have locks that are used more, use less. Uh, the actual wear is, is not horribly important. What's more important, as far as covert entry, surreptitious entry goes, is that we're we're analyzing all these parts of the lock that we just looked at, as well as more that, that shouldn't technically be affected by wear in any you know, huge way as far, compared to the pins. So we're going to look at the components, the pins, the springs. In non-pin tumbler locks, we'll look at all the other types of components, levers, wafers, discs, whatever. We're going to look at the plug, the cylinder. Some locks don't have plugs or cylinders. We'll look at whatever they're housed in. We'll look at the, the cam, the actuator. That's the back tailpiece that actually a affects the bolt. Uh, again, some locks don't have this. Some locks directly interact with the bolt. We'll look at the keys, if available. We'll look at the bolt. And then, of course, uh, as far as the destructive stuff goes, we'll look at the doors, windows, walls, everything else. So lock picking, uh, as we know, is we use a tension tool and a pick, and we manipulate these tumblers individually. We expect to find marks in all these red areas. At the top and bottom of the plug, we expect to find a tension tool mark inside the plug, we expect to find marks made by the, the pick going in and out, being moved around, the pins especially because we're touching them, as well as possibly the cam on the back because a lot of people put the pick in too far. It's a very amateur thing. Uh, sometimes we might find them on the front of the plug, but I think that that's kind of hard to tell only because we saw how normal use is, and it's hard to really identify what's a key hitting into it and what's a pick hitting into it. So that's what it looks like, and that's the bottom pin. And it's very clearly not normal use. And it's not just this one. This is a, a, a lock that's been picked once. And these are all five tumblers, if I'm not mistaken. So here's another one. Again, similar, a little different, of course, unique. But it's still the same. Again, still the same. The marks are a little bit different, but still the same. Here, again, lighter, but you can still very clearly see it's not normal wear. And this is the back pin. Again, we know this because it has the least wear, but it also, uh, the single marks indicate single pin picking. There's different techniques. The previous ones look more like they were raked or something was gently rubbed across them, but this one looks like it was very clearly lifted individually. Now, often we can tell the skill level of the attacker, <laughs> or at least estimate it in the case of lock picking. So as you can see, this is very scary. It's a nightmare on Elm Street as far as lock picking forensics goes. You can see very, very deep gashes, very numerous gashes. You almost can't even see what the normal pin looks like. Uh, here's an example of a very skilled attacker. Now, there are still marks. They're very light, but you can see them. Should I point them out, or can you guys see them? So here's one. Here's some more. We could also see a couple on the sides, which is we'll get into next that are more defined, but we can still see it. And so it's, it's not like you can just be very careful. It's very hard not to make marks while using uh, traditional picks. So the sides of the, of the pins we're also going to see. Remember, we're lifting between pin stacks to raise middle pins. Uh, in this example, you see some marks. Where are my mouse go? Right here, right here. And it's very hard not to leave these marks. It's very possible that you might get lucky like in this last slide and leave very few marks on the bottom, but leaving, not leaving marks on the sides is very, very hard. Here's more, they're very light. Here's more, and these are quite high up, so this is not gonna be caused by a pin, or excuse me, a key, because uh, obviously we saw what a key looks like, and the key wouldn't do these very distinct, uh, very small scratches. The side of the pins also tell us a lot about the skill level of the attacker. In the same way, I think this is actually from the same lock as that other one. It's just a random lock I got that I decided to do some forensics on before I did anything to it, and it happened to be picked to hell. And so you can see, compared to the last ones, these marks are quite deep, very deep. 
more so than they need to be. This indicates that they're using way too much tension, and that's causing them to use a lot more force with their pick to raise uh, pin stacks. It also means uh, that as they're doing this, they're scraping out a lot of material. From that, we could get pretty good tool mark analysis to determine if, you know, whoever's pick did that, because it's very clearly the thickness of the pick, right? The plug is also one of the best places to get information. The plug is that internal piece that you're inserting uh, your pick into. So the top of the plug, the very top channel of it, nothing ever touches. The key should never touch it because if it did, it couldn't be inserted into lock because it would be too big. And obviously the pins don't touch it because it's between the pin chambers, as you can see. So here you could see uh, very distinct scratching that would generally not be considered normal use. And with the kind of dirt and corrosion, you could also see that those are pretty fresh. So you could also, uh, you know, do sophisticated lab stuff to determine, uh, like oxidation tests and so on and so forth, determine when these marks were made. The inside of the plug is going to have quite a few marks uh, that won't be at all consistent with the use of a key. Uh, obviously, when we use a key, we're just going in and out, and it's straight. It's not at these weird angles like some of these are. So it can never be the key that's making these marks. Obviously, a lot of scratches. The angle of attack, well, attack, the angle of the tool mark doesn't make sense with the use of a key. Very clearly, something that's trying to manipulate this lock. And again, we could try and look at this to do a tool mark comparison uh, analysis. Maybe the tool left some material in here, and we can link it back to a suspect's tools if they're found. The pin chambers themselves also have quite a few different things, because obviously, the keys never going to touch those or else it wouldn't be able to come in and out of the lock if it's, if it's ch chunking off all this material. The pins aren't going to do it because if they did do it, they'd be scraping the entire length of the, of the chamber wherever they're moving. This is another example on the, on the other side of, of the lock cutaway. There's these, in the middle of the chambers, there's this gouge on that left one. If you compare it with the right one, it's pretty distinctly different. And if a key was doing this, then the key would be doing it on all, the ch all those marks up until where the key's supposed to stop, right? It wouldn't just be this one in the middle. It's, it's just not possible. Here's a close-up. And for my money, that's actually a very good tool mark. You know, you could see the angle of it. It's very deep, very, uh, uh, very easy to determine the thickness of whatever made it possibly left some material like all the other stuff. Up in the pin chambers, even higher, we can also find marks. Uh, now, can anybody tell me what this looks like? <laughs> What's that? Well, it's clearly a scratch, but wh what, what would have made that? And don't say a pick. No, no, no. I mean, what, what action? Close. Other other orientation. Not sight. Not raising the pick. Thank you. It's very clearly that person is trying to pick that, and they're looking for the shear line of that pin stack. So they're raising up and down, up and down, trying to find it. And that's very high in the lock. So we could look: uh, is that pin in the lock later when we disassemble it? Is that pin? Well, I guess it's already disassembled, huh? <laughs> is that pin supposed to be that high? You know. Maybe it's way too high than what they were trying. So again, that might help us determine the skill level because a lot of people, uh, when they're picking uh, amateurs, they'll just go, but that's not necessarily where the pin stacks are supposed to be. <laughs> Deviant's laughing because he knows it's true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we can also definitely find the tension tools. And uh, another beginner mistake is too much tension. And really, most things require feather touch uh, this I didn't even need to cut apart to see how clear that that mark is. Where is my line? Right here. Very clear line from where that tension tool binds up against the plug. If we cut it apart, we could get a, a better, uh, better tool mark. Here you can see these are scratches. How many of you have, have, have picked a lock with a tension tool? How many of you have had to jiggle the tension tool around to get it seated right? All the same people, right? That's what those scratches are. That's them trying to find where it is. And then finally, they settle on right here. And that's where the tension tool was finally placed. Uh, sometimes that's not so easy to find. And that's because, again, light tension is more of a, a skilled attacker thing. And it's more proper to do against the vast majority of locks. But even uh, without really 
I, sh I sh forgot to say it, all of this talk is done with like a $40 Chinese uh, digital microscope. So it's not, you don't need to be CSI to do this. Um, just the right lighting and you can catch all those same wiggle marks, right? You can also catch right here is that, that tool placement mark, right? The back of the lock, the cam, the tailpiece, uh, something the key should never touch, almost never, unless it's really bad. <laughs> or if it's a backstopped key, which is really not popular with pin tumblers. You see right here, very clearly, a big scratch. And what's kind of cool about this example is that there's a lot of rust, so you could pretty easily do an oxidation comparison between those two areas to determine when that, when that mark was make, made. That's not something uh, that the forensic locksmith will do, usually part it out to you know, the, the criminology lab, wh whoever you're working with, if this is something that's important. Skill is also very apparent on the cam. So normally, <laughs> when we do our villages, we, they're completely disassembled locks. They're not mounted, so the cam is usually taken off because it's usually just fluff, and it doesn't really help us. But when it is on, a lot of people don't realize they're actually at the back of the lock. And so they'll be, they'll be going like this, scratching, 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 and all they're doing is eating up the back of the lock. And again, great way to tell if they're actually skilled or not. Uh, great way to find tool marks, possibly trace evidence from their tool just because of such amazing repeated use. Also a great way to get this material onto their own tools to be found a later date and tied back to them that way. Uh, there's a lot of, recently uh, I gave a talk on the future of lock picking, which is terrible, but you're lucky you didn't see it, I'm just kidding. Uh, what seems to be happening is that instead of these generic attacks that we're finding, we're developing specific tools for specific locks. And some of those might not leave marks for, for various reasons. A lot of those do. And this is an example of a tool called the Metacoder, which John King uh, demoed at the last DEF CON? I, I'm pretty sure the last DEF CON. And Medico's been getting, all, been getting a lot of flack from uh, Tobias, from King's stuff, uh, because they were once thought to be, you know, uh, untouchable. And now there's a lot of in the, in the last two years, a lot of attacks have come out. And so this is a tool that hooks into this channel here and rotates this pin correctly. And Medico pins, they have to be raised as well as rotated properly. And then another locking mechanism falls into these grooves and it can fully unlock the lock. So you can see the scratch marks in the channel here are caused by his tool. Obviously, the, the key's not going to touch inside those pieces because it just rotates the bottom. The the sidebar is what it's called that falls into them, isn't going to make weird angled scratches like that. If it does make marks, it'll be very distinct, very um, uniform. Another tool is pick guns, and pick guns uh, are essentially uh, an old, I don't say old way to bump, but they're very similar to bumping. And how many of you know what bumping is? That's awesome. I don't want to waste time talking about it. <laughs> so essentially, does everybody know what a pick gun is? It's essentially bumping with a, a tool, not a key. And essentially, a pick gun is a, a needle that looks like a pick, and it slaps against the bottom tumblers in the same way that the key hits against the bottom tumblers, and they separate at the shear line, and you can open the lock. Uh, we expect to find these tension tool marks at the top and bottom, because you still need a, a secondary tension tool with pick guns. We expect to find these uh, striae in here, where the pick gun was inserted, as well as where it was, where it went off. Possibly on the cam, because uh, again, some people, it's, it's, I would say it's a little bit harder to tell with the pick gun how far you are in uh, until you actually hit it. But just that, that angle that the pick gun shoots up at might still scratch this a little bit. Also going to find marks on the pins, and what they look like are these little impact marks. And they're very distinct from normal wear, and they're very distinct from lock picking. And you can see there's two right here, and what's kind of cool is that after repeated pick gun uses, which is not uncommon to actually open the lock, they start to resemble this bicycle spoke thing. Because as they're hitting them, they're kind of rotating, just like the key does as it's being inserted, except they're just jumping up and kind of rotating around. And the cool part about this is that we can actually identify how many times the pick gun was used. Because each one's going to make a pretty distinct mark based on where it actually hit, which part of the key it hit, how hard it hit, so on and so forth. So you can see right here, they're a little separated, but there's at least three or four, right? And it, how many times they used it is generally not a huge, huge deal, but it might, you know, if we see a lot, we might say, well, maybe they took quite a lot longer than we would have expected to actually affect entry.
on the back, the cam, we'll see, you know, even more distinct markings. And we could, you could literally count, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, almost all of these to determine how many times the pick was used. And they're very distinct marks in the same way that those amateur lock picking things were, where we can, you know, hope to find uh, trace evidence on the pick gun if we ever find a pick gun or find pick gun material in the lock because of how much it's scraping off. <laughs> so, you know, the only reference I couldn't fit in was Lee Marvin, and that made me very upset. But pretty soon, I will find a way to put Lee Marvin into this talk. He might replace the guy on the microscope in the beginning. Uh, so key bopping is kind of this thing that, uh, again, I'm very guilty of this. Uh, everybody was like, oh my god, key bumping. How would, we, how would anybody know that uh, key bumping was used? And how would insurance companies know? Like they would just say, well, it's your fault. And maybe they could because many contracts were written before key bumping was popular. So they have no clause that says we cover you in the case of key bumping, only in the case of, of lock picking or very specific tools and te techniques. So people were very surprised, A, that that key bumping could definitely be discovered, uh, but also that it's probably one of the most damaging things you could do to a lock compared to all the other techniques you could pick besides destructive entry. So key bumping, we expect to find a lot of, a lot of marks. We'll expect to find marks on the face of the lock of the plug where the key actually impacts. Remember, we're using mostly shoulder-stopped keys, so that shoulder is going to impact pretty hard into that plug. We're going to find it on the bottoms of the pins, possibly the cam, because some bump keys go slightly deeper than a normal key should, possibly hit the cam. Uh, we're going to find in the, the inside of the plug, uh, as well as the chambers of the plug might be slightly distorted. So the act of bumping, basically we take a specially cut key and we impact it into the lock. And that works wonders for transferring kinetic energy, but that also impacts the shit out of the pin. And it's very clear right there that something impacted the lock, right? On a handmade bump key, uh, the cuts might not be so pretty. They might be very jagged, hand-filed, dremeled keys, usually very jagged, very sharp. They might actually scratch as they're denting. And with that, which I find very cool, we can compare that tool mark with a bump key if we ever find it, because every, every tool, including bump keys, have unique char characteristics that we might be able to tie back to a tool mark we found. And so in this case, you see very distinct scratch. And maybe that pattern of scratching, we can tie back to the bump key. Uh, sometimes alternate lighting helps in a lot of the different techniques. Uh, in this case, I use, uh, most of these are with LED light, but this is just uh, incandescent light. Maybe? I don't know. I have, I have a bunch of different lights on the table, and I pick and choose, and you find whatever works best. And in this, we could see uh, quite a few dents, quite a few scratches. And so, just like pick guns, we could see how many times it was bumped. Right? Because remember, we bump, we take the key out sometimes, we put it back in, that's rotating those pins. So the position we bump probably be different each time. Something that's kind of cool and uh, that we really haven't touched on is different designs of these pins. Uh, so this is the bottom of a top pin, right? And the bottom pins in this lock are rounded on both ends so that they're easier when you're, when you're pinning them. You could just put it on either side. You don't have to worry about which side's up, which side's down. In the case of this specific bumping attack, it, that round thing impacting very lightly with kinetic energy uh, is causing really big dents on the bottom of that top pin. And on when we, how many of you have bumped and it didn't work? Right? It doesn't always work, just like pick guns, takes a couple tries usually. Uh, when that happens, it's because your kinetic energy isn't transferring well, the pins don't jump altogether, whatever. What it usually ends up happening is that instead of all that kinetic energy flowing up and everything's beautiful like in the animations, uh, actually that front pin just gets slammed. Like all that kinetic energy goes to it and it doesn't know where to go. So it goes, uh, and it makes the, <laughs> you like that? <laughs> uh, things also said at the lock picking village. Uh, it basically just impacts against that plug and, sh and cylinder shear line. 
and it'll cause these little dents that are not really consistent with anything else. The next one's cool. Remember how I showed you how that bottom was impacted? In this case, the, the bottom has been impacted and this serration, which is a security pin, it's for anti-lock picking use. Normally it's open, like in here, right? And that's to frustrate lock picking. And here, it's been sealed shut because it's been bumped so hard, right? And so that base, it, it's not a big difference, but it is helping to defeat the anti-picking mechanisms of this lock, and it's very interesting. And in this same photo, you could also see where the failed bumps were, where these big, big dents are. The act of bumping, again, how these top pins are hit, they don't know where to go, and repeated bumping is going to stretch out the pin chambers. It's very slight, and it probably won't affect the normal operation of the lock, but you could see around this, this pin chamber, it's starting to stretch in almost all directions. And that's going to affect, again, binding, as we talked about earlier. Some ch pin chambers will be bigger than others now, offset. That's, this is helped by bumping. The face of the lock is one of the best examples. Um, but again, w we need slightly more information because that, that normal use, not the same, but similar. Um, so one or two bumps might look the same as normal use as far as the face of the lock goes. This is the lock that's been at like every conference I've ever had locks at. And it's very depressing how bad this lock is now. So you can see at the top of the keyway, big dents from where the key impacted it. Also at the bottom, most people don't realize that they have, the, the key has shoulders at the top and the bottom most of the time. And so bottom has also been impacting this. Again, another example, uh, this lock is not new, but it's very clean. And you can clearly see that that's not the same as what we had before. It's a very big dent rather than just a little light material removal. Uh, how many of you know what the minimal movement method of bumping is? A couple of you? The, the two guys that went to my talk before? <laughs> uh, minimal movement method is an alternate method of bumping where you allow the key to go in slightly farther and you, you, you start with the key fully inserted. It's a little different, same basic principle to bump the, sh the pins. Uh, when that happens, if you all look at your keys right now, you'll notice right around where the shoulder is, the key material starts to get thicker for that handle, the, the bow of the key. And when that happens, and they use that as a bump key, that slightly distorts that front plug material outwards because now it has to make room because you're forcibly impacting it into the lock. And that's very noticeable. And it's, I, I would say it's very rare that a normal key would, would displace material like that. Uh, impressioning is another technique that we just talked about in the village. Uh, I hope you guys, most of you saw that. It's basically a covert entry technique. Uh, and covert, when, I'm, when I say covert, covert leaves forensic evidence. That's why we're talking about it right now. Surreptitious techniques do not leave forensic evidence. And we'll get to that in a minute. Oh, wow, we're doing good on time. Um, so impressioning is this technique where we use a blank key and we, we put it in the lock and we apply a lot of tension and then we examine marks made by doing this on the key, file the key, until we get a working key for the lock. And it's very effective, it's very awesome, but it does leave forensic evidence. And really the, the only place we expect to find like really damning forensic evidence, because we're basically using it like a normal key for the most part, is on these bottom pins. And the reason for that is, think if, we're, if all the pins rest down here normally, and we put a blank key in, then they're all going to be raised all the way up here. The, the bottom pin tip will be right here. So they'll all be blocking at the shear line. And when we use that extreme tension, we're going to be cutting that in between the cylinder and the plug, some, somewhere in this area. And as we go through and we're filing down the key, those will be slightly lowered, lowered, until they get to their normal resting spots. So we expect to find these, these shear points all along the bottom pins. We do not expect to find them on the top pins, because if they ever allowed the top pins to fall right here, then the lock would never open because the key would be cut too low for those positions. So impressioning is very surprisingly easy to notice uh, because almost none of the tools or techniques actually touch the tops of those bottom pins like that. So here you can see there's quite a few shear, shearing marks and they're pretty distinct and again like bumping, like pick guns, we could tell how many times they impression the lock and it's a little different as far as impressioning goes. We can determine how many rounds of impressioning they had, as well as uh, if they knew how far to file between each cut. So you see here, they're very closely spaced. So that probably means that the attacker didn't 
uh, didn't know the key, key coding standards, so they went a little bit at a time just to be on the safe side, to make sure they didn't drop too low. In this example, you see they're pretty far apart, and so that means the person probably knew what lock it was, and it, it's not hard to do, it's all public information. So if you know the lock that you want to impression, you could just cut down to factory depths instead of filing little by little. It saves a lot of time and makes the impressioning process uh, much easier, um, but it also is somewhat noticeable to see on the lock. You see these are very staggered. We could also count it again to determine how many rounds of impressioning they went through. Maybe we could even get it so well that we could determine if they actually went through enough rounds to uh, make a working key for the lock. Uh, just like bumping, the act of impressioning causing extreme torque is going to stretch those pin chambers, but the only difference between this and bumping is that this is completely lateral. In bumping, we, can, we might stretch in any which way, but in this, we're only going back and forth with the force of the key either way. Um, something we talked about in the Lockpink Village was this idea of ultraviolet impressioning. And uh, it's a technique where we coat the blank with ultraviolet ink and then impression with it. And then when we take it out, the marks will be the positions that don't have UV, UV ink. And it's pretty effective. I find it, it's a little slower than traditional impressioning, but it's much more consistent. I don't have to worry about misinterpreting one of the marks because it's very clear where there is ink and there is not ink. And doing this requires that we reapply UV ink every time we take a cut, we file a cut on that, on that lock, and it's dumping quite a lot of UV residue on the key. You can see it's, it's in the keyway channel. Uh, I don't know if it's easy to see, but on that pin right there, we can also see it even without taking it apart. There's a little light UV residue, as well as on the shoulder right here. If we, you see, you thought I wasn't going to take it apart, but I did just for you guys. Um, we can also see on the pins, really clear UV residue, and there's really no good reason that UV would be here for anything else than impressioning. Really no reason, unless you carry like vials of UV ink in your pocket and one breaks and it gets on your key, but it's, <laughs> it's unlikely that that'll happen. And on this, you could see very clear key tracks of where it slid up and down the pins. Decoding is kind of this weird, ambiguous technique. We, we have lock picking, which very clearly opens a lock. That's all it wants to do. Uh, we have impressioning, which makes a key to open the lock. It might not be a durable key, but it does open the lock and technically makes you a key. Decoding doesn't necessarily do either of those. What decoding does is gives you the ability and the information, well, I should say the information, maybe not the ability, to make a or to, to know how to make a working key for the lock. So what that means is we can identify the specific pattern of cuts that should be on the, on the key. But again, that doesn't necessarily mean that making a key is easy because it could be a hard lock to make a key for. A lot of the high security locks, you might need specialized equipment to, to cut those key depths. Uh, there's this idea of covert versus, versus sur surreptitious and decoding is really hard to fit into a category because it's so ambiguous. A lot of decoding stuff is covert. A lot of other decoding stuff is surreptitious, which means we, we really can't tell if it was actually used or not. There's this idea of a decoder pick. When you pick the lock and turn it, now the bottom pins can only go as high as they're supposed to go as, as far as opening the lock. There's this idea of a pick that is basically a pick with a little lever that tells you how far up the pick is, and you can use that to decode the, the depths of each pin after you've picked the lock. There's also this idea of, of uh, manipulation of safes, which we talked about yesterday in the safe cracking thing, which is technically just using the safe normally, but you're taking diagnostic information as you're using it normally to determine uh, a combination safes or combination locks, uh, correct sequence of, of numbers, letters, whatever. That's surreptitious because how can we tell that it was used normally? You know, maybe in some cases they, they took a long time to do it and the wear on the internal components is much greater, but in general we say it's a surreptitious technique. There's also this idea of visual and optical decoding. I'm going to pull this up just because, oh, this user doesn't have sudo. I won't pull it up. I lied. Um, I'll tell you about it, and we might have to turn the cameras off. Um, there's this idea of visual and surreptitious decoding and visual means that we're looking at it or we're using surveillance or observation to determine uh, this. And every, how many of you have a key on the table right now? Anybody? You do? So what if I took a picture of that key? 
What if I have uh, uh, that, that fire sprinkler is actually my spy satellite taking high-res pictures? Could I determine the bidding of your, of your key? Could I look at the codes? Does the key have a code? No codes? None of them. Some, one of those keys has a code, I guarantee it. Could I look at that code? See, the lady behind you just decoded your key right there. <laughs> Um, could I look at that code and determine the bidding? Yeah. Could I look at the the code? Yes, I could. There's also this uh, there's this big published thing recently about how they developed a computer system that could extract the key bidding from a photograph of a key, which is v pretty obvious, pretty simple. Uh, there's a really awesome anecdote, probably the only good one I have, so bear with me here. Um, Diebold made a voting machine. And they were very proud of their voting machine that they put a picture of the key with the, the voting machine, like, you know, some, some guy like this, on the site. And so somebody was like, well, that's just a shitty wafer lock. I'll just make a key. And the key worked on every voting machine in the United States. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot of stuff is like that. Because people get lazy, and just like cryptography, handling key management is a bitch. It's much easier just to mass produce the same key and give it out to everybody. But you don't put it on your website for everybody to look at. <laughs> There's also this idea of, of uh, thermal decoding, which is uh, how many of you have used a keypad-based combination lock? Or you go, you know, 5, 5, 6, whatever. Uh, pushing that leaves thermal heat residue on that. And with correct viewing, we could look at that and figure out maybe not the direct combination, but the three numbers that are in it. And that leaves us a very small number of possibilities for what the actual combination is. And maybe, maybe that's within the max tries limit, and we could just automatically get in. That's another thing that's surreptitious. It's really hard to tell after the fact. Visual and optical, it, it depends. For the most part, I would say they are uh, surreptitious, but it, it varies. And uh, one thing I should point out that I should have pointed out a long time ago is when we speak of no forensic evidence, we mean as it relates to locks. So you could very well pick a lock and still have one of your hairs fall out, your you know fingernails, fingerprints, all that kind of stuff can still happen. But as we think of it, it's only as it relates to the lock. The rest is not the responsibility of the forensic locksmith, obviously. There's also this idea of radiological attacks. And we talked about this, again, in the safe cracking thing, where we basically, you uh, for lack of better terms, we use an x-ray, take a picture of the inside of combination lock to find out where the posi what proper positions for each, com for each component. I told you to get used to the stuttering. And uh, this is, uh, how, do, how do we tell? Maybe we can, but in a lot of cases, the ability to detect something is more expensive than whatever was stolen, so we won't bother. Unless it's a very you know, sensitive or high-profile thing, we're generally not going to be able to detect stuff like that. Um, and also, very few people are actually going to have the uh, skills and equipment and money to actually do some of those attacks, especially radiological. I don't know how many of you like bombard neutrons for fun, <laughs> but I'm guessing it, it's a very small number of you. Uh, there's also this idea of looking at the lock aside from the keys and decoding it visually. How many of you have seen a lock that has colored pins? Do you know what the colors are for? I know you know. You're cheating. T-Man? What, what are the colors for? Uh, the depth. Right, exactly. He says the depth of the, each component. So with that, couldn't you make a working key? If you have a ophthalmoscope, a borescope, just look in the lock real quick, note down all the colors, and then go home and make a key for it. It's very easy to do, and it's very hard to detect in a lot of cases. So we consider this, again, surreptitious, but in the, when we're writing a forensic uh, investigative locksmithing report will say we can't tell if this was actually used but it's a possibility it's very possible that uh, a, a skilled you know well-versed attacker would have done this because this is a problem it may not be the problem that allowed method of entry maybe something else we find uh, would be that but this is very it's a red flag another thing is that some locks specifically wafer locks really crappy ones actually sit at different heights when you look at them. And this is kind of a bad picture, but it's the only way for lock I have. But you can actually see, and I also cheated with a backlight source, but we'll pretend there's a light on in the room wherever this is. Bear with me here. And you can see that they actually sit at different positions. 
And this is just with a crappy microscope, not even a nice borescope or a nice ophthalmoscope. Um, and we can actually see where each sits. And from that, we could determine the correct key. Bypass is uh, probably the, the fourth of our, of our entry techniques. And bypass, um, a lot of people confuse, in, in my opinion, confuse lock picking and impressioning and some other stuff as the bypass technique. I consider bypass to be any technique that doesn't touch the lock cylinder components. So in, in bumping, we, we bump the components. In pick guns, we pick the components. In lock picking, we raise the components. In bypass, we can ignore them. We literally bypass them. And that doesn't mean we're not using a tool that's inserted into the keyway. It could be a variety of things. How many of you saw us do padlock shimming this year, last year, where we open the shackle of the padlock? How many of you have seen silly movies that, that actually do this pretty accurately, but the credit card trick on doors? It's a form of bypass, because that lock cylinder's integrity is still uh, maintained, um, but again, we, we still getting in. So in, these are also very ambiguous what a bypass means. It's usually an attack against the cam, the back of the lock, the bolt, uh, the shackle, something other than the lock cylinder components themselves. Most things that uh, aren't those fall under the, the auspices of a bypass. So one of the, the best examples is a lock that doesn't restrict that back cam tailpiece from rotating and actuating the, the locking bolt. Um, Oh, I thought you had a question. I only have five minutes, though. Okay, we'll go quick. So one of the big examples is this, the American 700. And basically what happens is that the lock sits on the bottom half of that. That might actually be an opened 700, but we'll say it sits on one half. And nothing restricts that piece from rotating that half circle. So you could just, there's a tool where you insert and you just click that thing over and the shackle pops open. Of course, using that tool is going to leave, leave marks where you're scratching it against whatever's in the back there. You can see them pretty clearly in there, on the bottom there, as well as the top. Uh, American made this uh, wafer that protects against the, the bypass. It was kind of cool. We, we usually talk about it in the majority of the lock picking general talks. And it's basically a little piece that fits over that, so you can't get to that. So in this picture, uh, we have the scratches where they were trying to bypass it. There's also a tool that was developed to break this. Basically, they made a little wafer. And they said, ha ha, now you can't bypass their locks. So somebody made, for all intents and purposes, a small knife. And you just hammered that little piece away until there was a hole. And then you put your tool in, and then you open it again. <laughs> it's a cool story. And they eventually ended up completely redesigning the lock. Oh, man, that's too bad. We have a lot more to go. Uh, so keys, we want to look at materials, keyways, cuts, codes. We want to know if it's an original, duplicate hand cut, machined, recently cut, recently copied, as well as material transfer. Keys are a good source of material transfer because we handle them. You know, we, we literally touch them, we put them in our pockets, and our shirts. Uh, they touch a lot of the things that can identify us. Uh, plating is a good way to determine if the key is factory original or not. Factory original plated keys will have the bidding plated as well, most of the time. Uh, when a locksmith gets him, his blank keys are plated. So when he cuts them, the positions he cut are no longer plated. We want to know if it's original or copied. And I'm gonna, I would normally ask you to, to use your magic to determine which is which, but we don't have time. So in this case, this is the original. And we know that because when we look at the copy, if you look on the left, that angle isn't quite flat. The angle, the slopes are different. The valleys aren't quite flat. The spacing's a little different, a little angled off. When you copy a key, usually what happens at, at your local hardware store, your local locksmith, is that you'll put two keys in. One's a blank, one's your original. There's a little tracing wheel that rides your key, and as it's writing the key, a cutter is also cutting that blank key, and that's how it works. And that, that rides on the side of the key where it didn't get wear, so you can see right here is that mark that it made. And it's very clear, and it's probably not going to go away for a while because right here is where the, the components are actually touching the key. We can tell if the key's handmade usually because the, the valleys are very bad, the spacing between cuts, the depth of cuts is very bad. Very clear that that's not a professionally made key. Uh, filing looks like that. I'm just going to skip through these real quick. Uh, these are all on the site at the end if you want to go through and look at them. Filing, we could tell the size of the file, the grade of the file, almost everything about it. Uh, Dremels, same thing. They look different, obviously, but they're similar. We can also determine the speed of the cutting wheel that cut the key. And this is kind of cool. So if you compare the two, you see that the, the staggerings 
much worse on this one. These are much farther apart. This is the lower speed key cutter being used. There's a higher speed key cutter being used. If you remember our key from the brand new, that was Factor Original, which used very, very high speed key cutters. So they usually don't have this, this real jagged staggering. That's more of a, you know, Bob's, Bob's hardware kind of thing. Uh, we can also determine for where, even here after this key's been worn, we could still pretty much see that staggering between them. Bumping, we could also tell if it's been used not only because it, it hits here, the, where those components are hitting the key, but it's also impacting the shoulder. Uh, impressioning, we're using a tool to grip the key, usually vice grips or some, some uh, proprietary locksmithing tool, uh, always going to leave key, tool marks. So here we see that's not normal. We look at it closer, we can see that's pretty clearly uh, vice grip, some kind of pliers. Maybe we can take that and we find that on a suspect, we compare a tool mark analysis, tool mark comparison. Uh, we can, you know, do a very good job of, of identifying what tools and who was there. Uh, residue used in a lot of copy-based impressioning, where we make a copy of a key by taking a mold of it. I made a copy with my skin earlier that's still kind of there. You probably won't be able to forensics that. <laughs> But here's a little bit of clay residue on it. And it's actually pretty hard to clean a key when you, when you stick it in clay, stick it in wax, which is next. It's actually pretty hard to get all of it off because you can only see so much. And even with a magnifying glass, you're probably going to miss something. Uh, again, more wax. Uh, UV residue, again, we talked about UV. Uh, Anti-forensics tools, are they possible? Maybe. Uh, there's very limited research into this. Not a lot of people have published stuff. They're difficult to use. If they are possible, they're difficult to use. Uh, I've tried brass, fiberglass, and carbon fiber, and none of them were anti-forensics. They all left some kind of mark, um, and they were hard to use. They were a pain in the ass. It may be expensive. If they are possible, I, I assume they're expensive, or somebody would have tried to make a normal lockpick like that. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Safe and vault forensics are kind of a talk on their own. Um, they're very cool. Can I keep going? Okay. Uh, in safe and vault forensics, we're going to look at the drill points. We're going to look at any writings, markings. Uh, a lot of safe attacks are more often than not destructive, just because in, in this day and age, it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier just to drill your way in. It may be louder, but it's much easier than sitting there manipulating it or any, really anything else, especially in the case of manipulation-resistant locks or safes. Excuse me. Uh, we might also find magnetic or adhesive residue where a drill rig was attached to the front of the lock. Uh, of course, we're going to find tool marks. Again, not all safes are combination safes. A lot of safes use the exact same kind of locks that we talked about, lever locks, wafer locks, pin tumbler locks. Uh, one thing is that drill points, some people just put holes in, in their safe and assume that they can get away with, with uh, insurance fraud just because, well, there's clearly somebody drilled into it. But the, the exact position where the drill was used is very important. And there's various ways to use a drill to open a safe. Um, but it's, it, for an experienced safe technician, it's very easy to tell if those, uh, those points could have been used to actually open the lock. Uh, I don't think we have time for the in investigative process, so we'll skip through this. Um, most of this stuff is on my, on my site, uh, which is the next slide. But if, if you're interested in, in locksmithing this sort of stuff, uh, you can, if you're actually a locksmith or, or a police investigator, you can look up the International Association of Invest Investigative Locksmiths. Uh, if you're interested in, in becoming, I, I'm not sure what their official licensing or membership requirements are, um, but you can contact them if you're interested. Again, they're definitely going to require that you have quite a history as a locksmith or an investigator. Um, that's just the way it is. Uh, as far as resources, we talked about there's only three books, and one and a half of them are in German. So I made a site that has all this information and a lot more that I, I, I couldn't fit into the talk. So lockpickingforensics.com. If it's easier, lpforensics.com. They both go to the same site. Uh, I, didn't, I always hate it when people put like a 1,000 links at the end, so just go to the links page on my site, which will also increase my ad revenue. And... Uh, <laughs> and uh, and you can get all the links to all the, all the best sites. Deviant site's on there. Deviant's tool site is on there. Tool uh, in, the, in Europe. Mark Weber, Tobias's site. A lot, of, a lot of great sites are on those links page. So I, I, 
Uh, if you're interested, I'd say go there as well as look at my site. There's also LockWiki, which is another site I run, which kind of is sparse on information right now because I'm the only one contributing to it for the most part. Um, but you're welcome to go there. If, if you have information to contribute, you're welcome to contribute. I'll probably be a total dick about grammar and stuff, but you're, you're absolutely welcome to contribute. That's why it's called LockWiki. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you.